<laughs> Welcome to a special holiday episode of the John Freaking Muir Pod. We will not be discussing anything holiday related, but since this episode airs on December 26th, I thought I would just throw that in there. We do, however, have a couple of real gifts for our listeners this week. Our first gift is my co-host for this episode. I want to welcome back to the pod fan favorite, living legend, and whirly bird expert, Chopper. Welcome back to the pod, Chopper. What have you been up to? Uh, just like everybody else, just kind of hanging out for the holidays, uh, not leaving the house, and uh, just having some fun as much as we can. Nice. Good to be back. Happy to be back. Great to have you. My second gift to our listeners is another fan favorite, guest contributor, and our virtual trail correspondent, Dr. Bob. For any new listeners out there, you really need to go back to some of our earlier episodes where Dr. Bob made some guest appearances and shared legendary stories about camping on top of Whitney and almost losing his tent, some memorable encounters with some unpleasant hikers, and of course, his story of Mystical Manny. Welcome back to the pod, Dr. Bob. Mystical Manny. I didn't know I gave up that much. Thank you. <laughs> and we have to start off asking about uh, the title here, Dr. Bob. Is that your trail name? Are you an actual doctor? What's going on with Dr. Bob? No, that's just a silly story. I'm not an actual doctor. Uh, probably my second or third, actually it was my first trail, my first JMT. Uh, I was with the, I had, that's a whole story in itself. I'd met a guy named Gio who I've been lifelong friends with ever since then. This was back in 96. But we, uh, we camped one night and hiked for several days, We're basically the, like, the entire trail with this Japanese guy, two Japanese guys. And the first one we met, uh, he asked in very bad English what I did. And Gio, uh, we had just experienced a bear encounter. And so my, my, my buddy Gio said, he's a bear doctor. And uh, my, the Japanese guy was, you know, his limit, his, with his limited English, he was yeah, <laughs> That's all he got was that I was probably a, veg a veterinarian or something, but I was a bear doctor or a bear specialist. And uh, so as far as trail names or whatever, I, uh, it's kind of been a joke between us that I've always been Dr. Bob. But otherwise, I have no, I have no trail names. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I'm going to refer to you now as the, the bear specialist. That's awesome. There you go. <laughs> now, Dr. Bob, I know you have uh, contributed to the pod, but have you listened to the podcast? Mm -hmm. Well, I've made a point of listening to every time that I've been on, I think. I do the same thing. Yeah, and uh, I think I've listened to one or two other ones here, and, uh, and here we are. Okay. All right. So uh, the ones you've listened to, you, you know that we have a regular segment on the pod called the Pro Tip Insight of the Week. So uh, at the end of the episode, we're going to turn to you, Dr. Bob, and we're going to say, all right, what is your Pro Tip Insight of the Week? What little tidbit, uh, piece of advice, uh, recommendation can you share with our listeners to make their next adventure that much more epic? All right. So don't be surprised by that. All right. I will not be surprised. Okay. I've already got it in mind. Oh, wow. Okay. Very good. Don't, yeah. don't lose it. Write it down. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't finished the second beer yet. So. <laughs> All <laughs> right. Really? No, I know you've been on the pod a few times, but uh, I don't think we've had, ever had a proper introduction to Dr. Bob. Why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Uh, <laughs> tell us about uh, your background. Where'd you grow up? What, what was your, your family unit like? And how'd you get uh, interested in hiking? Um, uh, my father, and I'm just holding this up yet, holding this up. You guys probably can't even see this because uh, yeah. we're on video. You guys can see this. That's me and the old man on top of uh, Mount Whitney. I'm about nine years old, somewhere in there, plus or minus. Hey, is your dad oh. wearing a three-piece suit and a That's bowler a hat in that picture? Bowler hat, yeah. No, he's actually wearing like a really heavy kind of leather, leatherish jacket, nothing, nothing, you know, a very sort of like outdoorsy leathery jacket. It looked like uh, it had tails. Yeah, no, no, he's got a sweatshirt on underneath that hanging out. Oh, okay, that. I thought he was playing the piano up there or something. Yeah, no, you know, and I've got the totally goober, you know, go look, I like, I had no, I, like, the first time I, this was the very first hiking trip I'd ever done, and my father never told me anything, it was just like, we're going to go for a walk, you know, it wasn't like we're going to hike up the highest mountain in the, you know, the, the, 
the con contiguous the United States or anything like that. Nothing, nothing to, for the first time ever. My father never said anything like, you can't do this, but you're going to give it a shot or uh, it's a long story, but yeah. he just said, we're going to go for a walk. Dude. It's just easier as a father to do that. Like just, yeah. Don't yeah. And uh, yeah. So he, uh, you know, so I, I went and I did it and uh, yeah, I, I was like nine years old and uh, yeah, that's, that's again, just for you guys really, or anybody. And that's the picture. Uh, for twenty nine ninety five, I'll send a <laughs> autograph copy of this photograph to anybody who wants it. That's a big uh, picture. Yeah. Make sure, make sure you send it to me uh, if you can digitally, and we'll we'll promote oh, okay. it on the on uh, Instagram before your episode airs. Oh, cool! That'd be a great idea. <laughs> Dad would love that, probably. Yeah. All right, and yeah, so you know that was my first introduction to backpacking, and my father. Uh, uh, took me on a few more trips. I, I probably gone, I, you know, between the ages of nine and 16, 17, I probably went on five trips with him, all, all in the Sierra, uh, you know, and uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's you... basically what I did, you know, backpacking wise with, with the old man. He was, he was pretty much the inspiration for it. And because your, your childhood hikes were in the Sierras, are we to assume that you grew up in California? Yeah, I grew up in mostly the Bay, oh, obviously the Bay Area. I grew up in the Bay Area, mostly in good old Sunnyvale, California. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Yeah, before before Sunnyvale was like nothing but tech, it was orchards. And I, I was lucky enough to experience a childhood where Sunnyvale was still full of orchards and I could go out and poach cherries and apricots and things like that. All right. Any brothers or sisters growing up? I've got one brother and one sister, and neither one of them are very much interested in the outdoors. Yeah. No. My parents divorced when I was young. When I was probably I was probably about eight or nine, and my brother and sister. Uh, my father just never really involved them in it. They were too young, really. So he never really involved them in any of the backpacking. And they had no real great desire. And I can't remember at all. Other than, uh, actually, on the back of this picture. Here, hold on. That's just for fun. <laughs> that's, oh, my, that's the whole, that's, the, that's, that's me and the sister and the brother. And uh, Was that a waterfall yeah. in front of us? That's, in, that's, a, that's up at Mount Whitney. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, well, not on Mount Whitney. That's that's uh, that's down there in the in the at Whitney Portal. But okay. yeah, that that's probably the closest they've ever gotten to Mount Whitney was being at the portal. And uh, my father had a great. He loved to like pack us all up on a Friday night and drive us out to the east side somewhere and camp for a few days. And uh, yeah, so but yeah, they never got into it. So. So why did it stick with you and not them? Uh, I think I just, uh, it stuck with me because my, my father did it. And I, I did find something to it. And if you really want to know, I, there was a movie called uh, My Side of the Mountain. Uh, came out in, I don't know, late 60s, early 70s. And it, it was about this kid in New York City who decides to run away from home and move to the Catskills or uh, run away to the Catskill Mountains or somewhere out there and live in a tree, my side of the mountain, look it up. And uh, he goes out and I was really into falconry at the time too, which is another story, uh, falconry. And uh, so this kid lived in the mountains in a tree with a falcon and hunted and, and uh, you know, for one and a half hours, I was like thrilled to death. I read the book a few times. I can't remember the author's name. Uh, so she was some ch she was some children's book author. She she might even still be around, but no, probably not. But <laughs> yeah, my side of the mountain. And I think that there was something about that at that time in my life when I was uh, my parents had gone through a divorce. I was you know, looking for things and trying to find myself and, you know, what better, where better, what the, what better place to be than in a tree in the middle of nowhere, I think, with a falcon, you know, and uh, yeah, so that, that was one of my big inspirations, but, you know, really it was my dad. I think he, you know, it took me out enough to where I, I, I caught the, uh, I caught the Sierra fever, you might say, and, you know, it's like, I always thought about being out there. And, uh, and it, you know, yeah, there you go. 
My, my co-host Chopper is texting me as we are going through this. The IMDb. It, it appears, yeah, IMDb, My Side of the Mountain, 1969. Really? There you go. Yeah, yep. 1969. Okay. Very yeah, good. it was a great book. Yeah. I have, I have to ask the follow-up question. Falconry. I was going to ask you about hobbies. I, I can honestly say that uh, when I got up this morning, I, I didn't think that I'd be hearing that falconry was one of, one of your hobbies. So you have to tell us about that. How did you get involved in falconry? I got involved in it as far as I read the book, and and I started to, uh, I started to, uh, you know, I just I wanted uh, I wanted to be that kid in the movie, and I wanted to have a hawk, and I you know a falcon, a hawk, I, and I learned everything I could about falconry, and at the time, uh, I almost convinced my father to buy me. A fal he was going to buy me a uh, what's called sparrowhawk, you know, a very sort of a beginner bird, you might say. It's not a red-winged, not a, a red-tailed hawk or anything, but uh, he almost bought me one. And then he started researching it and figured out, well, I could do this and I could do this, but, you know. <laughs> and eventually he kind of he kind of canned the whole idea of buying me a falcon because I we would have had to have built a you know, a giant cage for it and given it so much room and done all this permitting and everything. And it just didn't work. You know, so the falconry thing kind of died, but the, the backpacking thing certainly didn't. And I, you know, I spent a lot of time in my teenage years uh, organizing trips and darn, I didn't bring those photographs, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, I tried to, uh, my first, my first back, well, not my first backpacking trip, but my first sort of trips where I was sort of the organizer was, uh, uh, Co Park, C-O-E, Co Park in, uh, southern, in, uh, basically just south of San Jose, Morgan Hill, that area there. My dad took me there a couple times and it was a great place to go and, and kind of like, uh develop your chops as far as backpacking goes you could go there and it was really it wasn't the sierra it was you know it was foothills it was it was nice and i i constantly had to persuade friends to go do go do these hikes with me and they were always uh adventurous disasters those are the best kind right yeah yeah it was great nice now i i'm really disappointed to hear that you you didn't actually have a falcon or a hawk I, the, the legend of Dr. Bob was about to take flight. I, I just had these images in my mind of you know, your 14 JMT trips that uh, you've got this falcon perched on your shoulder as you're, as you're hiking through. No, no. <laughs> uh, no, no, sadly, no. I never even got that. The closest I ever actually got to any actual, to any, any actual live hawks and or falcons was I used to go to this place up in San Jose called uh, Quim, I can't even remember what it was called, Alum Rock Park in San Jose and they had a nature center and I would go there and they had hawks and falcons you know in in the nature center and I would I would just go there and watch the birds. I'm, I'm surprised that I never got involved in in uh, any sort of uh, uh, outdoor pursuits. I mean, I, I, I wasn't involved. I, I mean, I was too stupid for science, but why didn't I ever get it? Why didn't I ever volunteer as a kid to be there with the Hawks? I would have loved that, you know? Um, I also, and this might be a note you might take, but I, I, I also, the book, um, uh, and we can do this, right? With the book, uh, sure. there's a book out there and it's called The Last Season. Ever heard of The Last Season? I have not. Book. Have not heard of that, that down. Oh, well, then you guys should read the last season. Okay. So there's the book, The Last Season. And it came out in uh, the early 2000s, maybe. And I saw it a couple times in the bookstore. You know, sometimes it was piled high on the, you know, as soon as you'd walk in the bookstore, there'd be, oh, the last season. And it's, I, I never touched it. And finally, one day, uh, with nothing better to do, I was in the bookstore and I looked at it and I started thumbing through the photographs and I realized wait, that's, you know, this guy's name is Dana Morganson, and my father has always raved about Dana's photography, or not just photography, but so much that he was a relative of ours. And, uh, and then Randy, the book last season is about the ranger, Randy Morganson, who uh, disappeared in, what was it, uh, 
1996, the first time I did the John Muir Trail. He was a ranger up at the, my second beer is really inhibiting me right now, but he, <laughs> he, was, he was a ranger at the, uh, on the John Muir Trail. We'll just put it that way. It'll come to me in a second and I'll blurt it out. But he was a ranger there at, uh, just before Pincho Pass. What is the place? Just before Pincho Pass. And uh, uh, he was a ranger there for a billion years. And, and he had gone off one day and never come back. And the whole book about the whole idea of, or the whole thing about the last season is what happened to Randy Morganson. And uh, when I saw these pictures, I realized, oh, wait, this was my cousin, you know? And I used to, I used to go to his house when I was a kid. He lived in Escalon, California. He's your actual cousin. Yeah, he was an actual cousin of mine. Cool. And I really, you know, I didn't know a lot about him. I didn't, at that time, I didn't know anything about him. He was just a cousin. And I would see him on these visits that I would, I would go to my grandmother's and my grandmother would take me down the block to visit the Morgansons and, you know, the cousins. And, and you know, you're a kid, you don't think about any of that stuff. And, but now I always wish that, man, I wish that, you know, Randy had talked to me and said, yeah, you should be a ranger, you know, or be in the, go in the Sierras more or something like that. But uh, yeah. Okay, now let's try and go back to wherever we were. So spoiler alert, what, what happened to Randy? Uh, well, Randy died. I mean, the whole movie, the, oh, what, ha what, what happened to Randy? Randy was eventually found in the Sierra, uh, or parts of him were found. We'll put it that way. Read the book. Oh my. Oh my. Yeah, parts of Randy were found. They were at least able to verify that Randy had died in the Sierra, or he could be living in South America with a beautiful South American woman. I don't know. But yeah, basically, Randy, probably they, they what's the word? They surmise they, something that Randy probably fell through an ice bridge of some sort, uh, was, you know, broke a leg or something and was trapped. And the animals eventually ate him. Oh, wow. You know, they found... Uh, they found portions of his uniform, I guess, or maybe even his name tag. But the book is great. Uh, the book was written by a guy named Eric Blame, B-L, yeah, everybody knows. If anybody's here on the John Muir page, they all, they've all read the last season, or they're about to. Well, to add it to our, uh, our list of things to do. Yeah, the last season. Check it out. We are always looking for great adventure media to kind of keep us connected to the trail. So we've got, we've got two recommendations already. We've got the, uh, the last season and uh, the falconry uh, movie. My Side of the Mountain. My not Side to, of the Mountain. Not That's to be right. confused with the ski side, with the ski movie, which was also not, not a favorite of mine, but later in life, certainly now. Excuse me. Uh, uh, a big thing in my life. All right. But yeah. And, the last, yeah. My side of the mountain. Okay. And, and Dr. Bob, what, what do you actually do for a living these days? These days? Uh, or in the past, too. In I mean, the past, what, what, what is, I've, What's I've, been your I've, career trajectory? My career, uh, career trajectory is I've worked mostly in catering, hospitality. Yeah. A lot of catering. You, you can't hike the John Muir Trail in uh, 14 times, 15 times. Uh, if you have a regular job. I mean, if you've got a regular job as a teacher, yeah, you can take every summer off and do it. But, and I tried to be a teacher, but I could never pass the math test. So um, yeah, I've always been working, I've always worked in, in catering, hospitality, temp gigs, basically, a lot of temp gigs. And that affords me the time to do things that I want, but not necessarily the money. Uh, and the JMT is really close and it's cheap, and we'll, we can go into that later. Yep. Well, you, you say that all the time with the people you interviewed, Doc, uh, recently. It's like they have to have a job where they can take off 14 weeks or 15 weeks and just kind of disappear for a bit and then come back and make a few bucks and go back out on the trail. That's, That's pretty right. common. That's right. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, I think the correct lot. answer... The correct answer, Dr. Bob, is your, your career is hiking the JMT, and that's not a bad career. No. Yeah, there you go. 14 there you times. Go. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, yeah, I just, you know, I, I, I spend my days, or I, pre-COVID, I spent my days, you know, schlepping food around and, you know, setting up events to make people, you know, happy at tech parties and stuff like that. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, Chopper, Chopper, we've got a food expert here on the on the pod, so I'm interested to hear what Dr. Bob's preferred food on the trail yeah, is. What do, you, what do you pack that's freeze dried or dehydrated? Uh, basically, for me, I I go. I worked. I've 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 I've. Uh, what's the word? I've uh, I've I finally got it to where I. I spend the first half of the trail eating mostly processed, not, no, I shouldn't say processed, I should say uh, heavy foods. Right. And the second half of the trail, that's where I break out, you know, when I get to Vermilion Valley Resort. Write that down, guys. Vermilion Valley Resort. When I get to Vermilion Valley Resort and I pick up my second and or first resupply, I have all the expensive dehydrated meals and I pretty much finish off the trail with the dehydrated meals. But prior to that, I do a lot of really cheap, heavy things. I do a lot of Trader Joe's. Um, you know, it's, it's always fun to read the comments from all in, in, in the various JMT groups where people spend months and months and months dehydrating things or shopping for things. I usually go out to, and spend about half a day five, six hours, I run to Trader Joe's, I run to Smart and Final, I run to, what's that other big box store? Uh, I run to that big box store because they have the jerky I like. Costco? Costco, Costco. I run to Costco <laughs> and I buy jerky, you know, or whatever else. And, uh, and then I bring it all home and I ship it all out. And I, I, usually have, I usually have two drops, one to Tuolumne and one to VVR. And we could go into that later too. Do you prefer to go northbound or southbound? I absolutely prefer to go southbound. I think, uh, I think northbound is, is uh, sorry, suckers, you know? I mean, everybody that's like, it would oh, be I love rough. northbound this year. Everybody's like, I love north. Well, of course you did, because it was all you could get. But uh, I wrote a blog, I wrote a, I have a blog post. I have a, my own blog that I don't even work on anymore, but it's called what would John Muir do dot blogspot dot com. <laughs> and I wrote a post there kind of defining what it means to like hike south versus north. And uh, to me, it's all about hiking south. You know, I, I can't see ending up in Yosemite Valley because and I don't want to bad mouth Yosemite Valley too much, but really, I mean, we're Americans, we're people, we're humans. We all want to get to the top of something, right? So you all want to get to the top of Mount Whitney. You don't want to get down to Yosemite Valley with all the other people. Uh, I kind of think it's really, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a definite South, North to South hiker, I mean, so for the 14 that you've done, you did it continuous all time? You didn't section hike any sections? No, I haven't section hike anything, except for the last three times that I, uh, two or three times that I haven't actually finished the trail. It's, we can write that in your notes because that's down there somewhere. That's in the other section. That's in the section called uh, people that really annoyed me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've hiked every, every, every time I've done it, I've done it, uh, north to south i started in the valley which is another thing if you don't hike from to, from happy isles to tuolumne you're missing the hardest part of the trail uh, it's right up there yeah you know it's uh, to me that's kind of like where you get your boy scout medal you know if you don't finish the jmt at least you hike from the valley to tuolumne because that's the hardest part. You, uh, for most people, they, they've come from a great distance. They've come from New York or Tennessee or, or Australia or, or Japan, and they've jumped off a plane and they've spent a night in San Francisco, let's say, or Los Angeles. And, you know, and then a day later, they find themselves in the valley. It's 90 degrees, they're totally jet lagged. And then, you know, they have one night to sleep in a noisy backpackers campground there in the valley. Stop number 18 on the free bus route. And they, <laughs> and they get to, is it stop number 18? And, you know, and then they have to start in the morning and it's just a real challenge. Even if you come from San Francisco, like I always do, and you end up spending a day in the valley waiting for getting a walk up. And then you, you know, you start the next day or even that day. I've done that several times. It's still, it's a real challenge to, to get 
to get going, you know? And, and I've met, having done it a few times, I've met lots of people that have bailed in Tuolumne. You know, they bailed because it was just too hard to get to Tuolumne, or they got too many blisters, or, you know, gear failure, all of those things, everything. Um, Tuolumne is, you know, the valley to Tuolumne is really important. If you start in Tuolumne, it's like la-di-da, you know, you just walk out and you spend that whole first day. You know, it's not till maybe a few days later that you figure out that, you know, things are bad. But yeah, that, trip, that trip up the Donahue Pass is pretty rough, though. That, that, that hits you at the end of day one if you start at Tuolumne. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. But, you know, I mean, uh, uh, a lot of people don't even do that day one. They do it day two, as far as I'm concerned, because every time I'm out there, I'm like, yeah, I know exactly where to go. Come up and stay with me. And nobody ever does. They always end up hiking from Tuolumne. And then they hike up to, they, they stay like either in Lyle Canyon, down right. low in the trees with the bears and the mosquitoes and the, you know, whatever other bugs there are. Or they go up to Lyle Creek Bridge, horse camp, whatever it's called. And they stay there in the trees, you know. And then the next day, you know, they hike up and they make, they spend another hour getting up to, getting up to the base of uh, Donahue and hiking over. And, you know, so they don't, yeah, yeah they don't, uh, they don't do it. <laughs> so it sounds like you prefer to sleep up above the uh, tree line. Oh yeah, uh, uh, certainly that first day. I don't know, I, I would say probably all the time. I prefer to sleep as high as I can get. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, certainly that very first day out of Tuolumne, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay up high. It's not a, never been a problem, you know, and uh, I highly recommend it, although I'm tired of telling people where to stay. I've given up on telling people like the best, coolest spots. You know, it's, it's time for everybody to get out there and find it for themselves. There's a great quote uh, that I have on the back of one of my JMT journals, and it's from Randy Morganson, who talks about, you know, don't ask. Basically, he says, don't ask me, just go and find for yourself, you know. Every, and, you know, every time I see a post, what's the best place, to, where are the best places to camp? It's like, I stopped answering those. And uh, for, you know, if, if anything, I know the best places and I don't want to find, I don't want anybody to find those places right now. <laughs> you don't, you don't you know. want to take up the spots. Every time I see a post about this place or this place or this place, and, I, and, and you know, the post involves nothing more than, yeah, we raced past this place or we didn't, you know, we didn't stay here or we took a picture of this and we kept going. I'm like, Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, Dr. Bob, I was, I was going to ask you a little bit later. I'm going to prepare you right now. I was going to ask you for your top five campsites on the, on the trail. And so maybe if you don't want to give those up, think of uh, campsites six through 10 so that uh, the top five yeah. stay, stay untouched. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I want to give those up. Um, certainly Donahue Pass, but for all of you that, uh, for all of you that stay down in the trees the next morning, you know, there's kind of a general rule that every time you wake up in the morning and you hike for five minutes, you'll go, oh, damn, I could have stayed here, you know, and, and, and that's it. That's, that's, that's really it. You know, it's, uh, yeah. Well, there's so many, I mean, there's 210 miles. There's, so there's 210 beautiful spots to look at or, or even more than that. It's just, you can't pinpoint every beautiful spot on the J and T. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you really, you really can't. And uh, I mean, there are so many places that I have not stayed, that I still go to. And, you know, I'm so, you know, I'm getting older and I, I'm, you know, I started doing the JMT. My first time was in 96 and, you know, it's 2020 now. And uh, maybe the last time I finished the trail was, uh, I don't know, 2017, uh, but you know, you, you're still, it doesn't matter. You're still, you're still going, I still haven't stayed there. You know, I mm -hmm. still haven't stayed there. There's only one magical place. And for 50 bonus points, if anybody can figure out where that magical place is, uh, you can stay there. But there's one magical place that it took me maybe five, six, seven, maybe more than that, maybe more than seven times to finally go stop. Just stay right here, 
just be and just experience everything that you've done in the last whatever it is, how many days it took you. All right. So Chopper, we have a challenge. We, we, how many bonus points was that? 50 bonus points? Yep. Chopper and I are going to take some guesses at the magical place to see <laughs> which one of us can get the 50 bonus points. I have three, I have three uh, locations in mind right now. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, we come back from the break. We're going to try and uh, ask Dr. Bob about how gear has changed from his first ascent of Mount Whitney with his father to his, uh, his, his last hike in the Sierras and talk about how his gear changed and what his preferred, preferred gear is. We'll be right back after this. This is Dr. Bob, a.k.a. Bob Shattuck, and I want to say listen to the John freaking Muir pod if you want to find out the latest and the greatest out there. Thank you. All right. Welcome back. Talking to Dr. Bob here. Got my co-host Chopper. Dr. Bob, when was that picture taken with you and your dad on top of Whitney? What year? It was about 1969. So 1969, that was uh, 51 years ago. And uh, how has the gear changed in the last 51 years? What, uh, what did you start out with on your, your first, you know, long distance hikes? And what have you, what have you uh, upgraded to these days? What's your preferred uh, kit? I can't really tell you what I hiked with in, 1950, in, in 1969 at my first time up Whitney, other than the fact that it was all basically cotton, you know, and my father wore a heavy leather jacket, and I had, uh, you know, a totally, a totally insufficient uh, jacket. I didn't have any down. I had a down bag. We rented down bags, and that's another story. Um, wearing a pair of Levi's, some um, uh, wearing you know stuff. jeans and yeah, the whole bit, yeah, everything totally cotton. You know, that's cotton what that's what cotton. that's what Chopper hikes in. He, ch he hikes in yeah, jeans, five hundred ones, I think. Really? Oh, well, I, I, I've uh, you know advanced wearing cut off jeans. It's a better look for me. <laughs> yeah, there you go, cut off jeans. That is pretty sexy. And, you, but, and you're uh, going up Mount Whitney with a you know a can of Coke or something like that. That was all you had. You got it. <laughs> yeah. I think. Uh, but uh, fast forward to my first JMT, and I still didn't know anything. I really didn't, you know, I, we, could, we could go backwards and talk about what inspired me to do the JMT, uh, if you want. But Sure, yeah, let's do that. Oh, let's do that. Um, I, you know, I, I, going all the way back to my teen years, I'd had this, you know, I kept bugging my friends, and, you know, my father took me out enough times, and my, and I would, like, bother my friends to go out. They weren't really backpackers uh, per se or whatever you say, but they were, you know, they would, you know, they had stuff. We all had cotton sleeping bags or whatever. And, you know, I'd, I'd take them out to Co Park again. But uh, I was really, really, you know, uh, looking to do, you know, some serious back, real backpacking. I don't know. I did one, my first solo trip was actually as a teenager. And, uh, my father had all my gear locked up in a closet and I, so I had to, well, a big room and I, I basically had to like kind of like sneak it out at opportune times over the course of a few months before I went on my first solo backpack trip, which I wanted to do from, I wanted to do this, the, uh, the, the High Sierra Trail basically from, you know, the west to the east end up in, you know, at Whitney and I, I did you know, I got all the gear out of the closet, the old Svea stove, my universal pack, uh, my 1972 trail-wise sleeping bag rated for zero below 50 or something uh, that my father bought me. That's another story. But uh, I only made it, I probably made it three quarters of the way before I realized I was lost and I was very lost. And I luckily found some uh, trail crew people that turned me in the right direction and basically sent me back to where I started. But, but um, my first solo trip, my first successful trip, and I, I decided to redeem myself and do that again. So my first successful solo trip was in probably 1994 when I went from, uh, again, Mineral King, the, the High Sierra Trail, and I had bought a, a really expensive, like in 1994, I bought a, uh, uh, like five hundred dollar, <laughs> uh, five hundred dollar Dana Designs uh, 
astral terraplane or whatever it was called, you know, which I, which I still have, but I bought that pack and, uh, and didn't know anything, didn't think about anything else really. It was just like, you could stick anything in that pack. As they say, you could stick a kitchen sink in there. And I pretty much did. Uh, yeah, I just grabbed stuff and went and did it. And I was successful. I got all the way to Mount Whitney and went down and, and, and uh, uh, when I was on Whitney, that's when I met two people, a guy named Jeff, who I won't go into his last name, Jeff and his wife. And I had spent the night on top of, I had gotten to the, I'd gotten to Whitney and. Uh, Is this the tent story? This is no. This is not the tent story. This oh, okay. Is the tent right. away story. No, this is not that. Okay. This is the. This is my very first time solo on top of Whitney, and I had and and I got up there. Uh, probably at uh, like uh, twelve o'clock in the afternoon or something, and I spent the whole day there. And if you spend any time on Whitney, uh, I mean, it's. I don't know. I spent the whole day and there was nobody else there after 12 o'clock and it was really kind of eerie and weird. And I was like, okay, I'm going to spend the night here and there's nobody here and I'm feeling strange. And I was basically packing up my stuff to go sitting in the hut there and uh, people appeared. Uh, this guy named Jeff and his wife, this Japanese woman. And uh, suddenly I was like, oh, this is great. They appeared. And then this guy from Czechoslovakia showed up, or from Czech Republic, he showed up. Ivash, E I V O, Ivash, he showed up and he had climbed the Mountaineers route and come up. And suddenly I was in heaven. I'm on top of the mountain and, you know, these guys have food. The Czech guy had booze and we sat in the hut all night. And, uh, hey, you got food and booze. You're good to go. We, yeah, we sat in the hut all night. We drank, drank the Czech guy's booze and just talked and talked and talked and drank a lot of tea and, uh, and they told, and, and the, the, the Jeff, Jeff, Jeff and his wife, I can't remember her name, but they told me all about the JMT. And I was really kind of like, I'd never heard of it before. I, I, well, I'd sort of heard of it, but not really. You know, it's like JMT, JMT, what is that? Where does it go? What do you know, where does it start? I knew nothing about the JMT. And, uh, but I, you know, they got it in my head. That, wow, this is what I have to do, the JMT. <laughs> And so the next day, they they we all hiked down together, and uh, and uh, and disappeared. You know, they they we all got on a bus, and uh, the Czech guy disappeared. Actually, his friends were there, and and uh, but that was the inspiration for doing the JMT. Was that that night spent on the, you know, if that hadn't happened, if I had just gone down maybe, and you know gone to Whitney Portal and then gone to, gone into Lone Pine and spent my 10 bucks on a bus uh, and gone home, I, I might not have thought about the JMT. So in, the, in 1996 or whenever it was, how much did that gear all weigh for taking that trip? Because you, you carried it. Oh, it was heavy. It was heavy. Uh, uh, the first JMT, my first JMT, I had nothing but, uh, I, I had this $500 pack that could carry, like I said, everything. everything yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks for stopping me. And uh, I, I was basically, I had cotton. I had ski pants with me. Okay. It, it, it weighed, like the guy at the bus stop, at the train stop, at the Amtrak stop, uh, he kind of picked it up and then said, oh, here, go ahead. You can, you can do it, you know, and you can, <laughs> throw it in the, you can throw it in the train. It was that heavy. It was a really heavy pack. I would imagine it weighed somewhere between 60, 70 pounds. Did you resupply then, or was it all just one shot? No, uh, no, I actually did. I resupplied in Vermilion, but I was, I was essentially, I had, like I said, I had ski pants in the pack, and everything was cotton. I had a big, I had a big cotton sweater. Uh, uh, it just, I had a lot of stuff that I didn't need, and uh, did I mention the ski pants? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was it was actually July of uh, that year, and uh, yeah, I had way 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 too much stuff, and uh, yeah, uh, but that was only part of, that was only part of the problem of that very first trip. And and again, I want to you know, just going back to that very first trip. Had it been perfect, like most people, you know, again, 
they start out a year ahead. You start seeing them on Facebook, on the John Muir Trail pages, and they're all planning their food, and they're buying super light sleeping bags and jackets, and they want to know, you know, all this stuff they can spend money on. I didn't do any of that. I just said, well, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this, and I've got all these, you know, heavy cotton ass pants and things. I didn't have Levi's. But, uh, you know, and, and that's kind of what I filled my pack with. I didn't have Facebook. I didn't have any other kind of reference, you know, certainly online to do it with. I was just like, well, I'm going to take this and this. And I can't think of I think the ski pants were the most outrageous thing I had. But I was prepared for snow. Uh, I had a really big, like, hunting knife, you know, like a Bowie knife, you know, right. military, marine, one of those things, you know, you see. The guy, I had one of those. <laughs> And that's funny because it's kind of followed me through the years. Not that I, I, I got rid of it immediately. I never even used it. I, did, I never even used it as a trowel to like dig a cat hole, you know. It was just inconvenient. But it looked really cool and probably scared that's, all the people. That's the important part there. I had, it on my, yeah, I had it on my shoulder. It was right there. It was ready for bear. It was ready, you know, ready for bear. Well, you're yeah. a bear specialist, so that, that yeah, makes sense. Exactly. And a couple of observations from, from your stories there. Um, one is we've come across this many times and I'm, I'm going to refer to it from, from this point forward as the butterfly effect moment. You know, if not for one little conversation or from, from a, a random thought passing through someone's mind uh, that gets them hooked on hiking and backpacking and doing the, the John Muir Trail or other trails, I mean, if they, if they didn't have that what I'm calling the butterfly effect effect moment, you know, none, none of this would have ever happened. So that, that meeting of uh, the man and his wife up on top of Whitney, and they told you about JMT, you know, there you go. You're off to the races. It certainly made an impression because you did it 14 times. Period. Yeah, uh, it certainly did. I, but, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily that, that, that I mean, they got me going. But what really got me going was probably the, the uh, I won't say the failure because I completed it, but uh, I didn't have the perfect moment. I didn't hike. And, 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 and you know, this will be the spoiler alert. This is, this is, this is my, uh, what were we going to say? The, uh, down the line, at, at the very end, you're going to say, what's the what my, what's what's the what's the most important thing? It, it really is the cliche. What, the cliche of, of hike your own hike, you know. And that very first time that I hiked the JMT, I did not hike my own hike. I hiked someone else's entirely. Basically, you know, I got out there and uh, and started up and I met someone and again I knew nothing uh, really you know I had this really big expensive pack and filled with cotton stuff and uh, and I knew not I, I had a couple maps I, I bought a uh, the John the Harrison maps mm -hmm. you know but I never yeah. read like I never read Elizabeth Wink's book which I don't even know if it came out then in 96, but I didn't have any other references. I just had a map and I knew this trail was there. And so I, you know, I kind of went, I kind of went for it with, with, with 60 pounds of odd gear that I probably never used. I never put the ski pants on, um, even though there was snow sometimes. I was only walking over snow. 96 was, uh, 96 was a big year for snow on, on, uh, on, it, it was July of 96, I believe. And it was a big year for snow on top of at least Donahue Pass. The rest of the passes were easy. Donahue is really the only pass, if you want to talk about passes that are difficult. It's the only difficult pass when there's lots of snow because all the other passes uh, have been trod upon by the PCT hikers and anybody else who's done it. And they're very sort of... Uh, what I always call, you know, they're, they're the knife edge passes, you know, there's no mistake right. about where you have to go. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I have, I have a lot of respect for folks who did the JMT back in the, in the nineties and before, because you're right. There were, there were not a lot of online resources. I mean, when, when Chopper and, and Buddy and I did it, 
uh, starting back in 2015. I mean, there's a lot of information online. We were able to research and read all kinds of stuff and really plan it out thoroughly. And, uh, you know, back in the 90s, that kind of stuff didn't exist. And so yeah, you're, 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 you got a map. Yeah, you got you got your map, you got your gear, and you you hit the trailhead. That's that's pretty impressive. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so so Donahue was probably the biggest challenge of my trip in '96. Uh, my biggest challenge, terrain wise, you know, of kind of not knowing where I was going. Right. Everything else was like you know, almost self-explanatory. There's. Mather, there's Pinchot, you know, there's, a, you get to the top and you're in, in this very small space and it's like, okay, I know exactly where to go to get down. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now you mentioned earlier, uh, you, you had a phrase, you said gear failure. I, I'm not sure what you were, I think talking about other folks, but uh, has there been a particular piece of gear that has failed on you uh, more than once? You know, what, what, uh, what, what do our listeners have to look out for in terms of their their gear failing uh i've never really had anything fail on me so much as i've had things come through for me um i'm a big fan of tevas uh, if you <laughs> if you ever look on the john Muir trail page you know, any one of them probably there's if in and if you google tevas slash you know comma bob shattuck or something you'd find a lot of comments by me about Tiva, and I, I really think uh, Tiva sandals in general are a great thing to have. Um, I've spent a lot of time on the trail in them, and and I just kind of you know I, I've given up almost like you know talking to and trying to convince anybody that oh Tivas that weigh you know a lot more than anything else are the best thing you can actually have. I mean everybody is out looking for cute neon water shoes. Or, you know, the absolute lightest sandals they can find, you know, uh, which these days, I guess there are a couple brands of really super light, you know, sandals. But you just don't want those if you're doing the JMT. Really, if you're doing any big hiking, you know, and carrying weight over days, uh, it's just, it, you know, it's, it's the one thing that if you're going to spend, if you're going to have, if you're going to have any extra weight, you know, it's best to have it right under your foot there and have a pair of Tevas on or, or a pair of Chacos or something like that. They're really great. Um, I've met so many people that have, that have uh, blown out their boots or they've had ankle injuries or uh, you know, anything that can befall your feet, below your knees, you know, your feet, uh, you know, and they weren't prepared. They, you know, they ended up having to hike, cancel their trip because their blisters in their boots were just too painful and they didn't have anything but a pair of you know flimsy uh, thongs to walk in because oh these are my camp shoes these are my river crossing shoes you know your your thongs and those silly river crossing shoes water shoes as they call them or whatever those are useless on the jmt especially if you have to walk in them and i always preface a lot of these arguments about shoe you know footwear with you are never, ever going to need a second pair of shoes, you know, and, and it's, it's true. I mean, these days, you're never going to need it. You know, I mean, lightweight trail runners are great. I haven't totally moved into that area yet. I'm getting there, you know, but shoes in general are really good. And if you break them in, they're fine. But should you ever need a second pair of shoes? Should your shoes burn in a fire that you were trying, you were trying to warm your shoes and they, they ended up getting toasted in a fire or they blow out because they're just crummy construction uh, or you have an injury it, it, for any reason that you can't fit in your normal hiking shoes. It's great to have something like a pair of Tevas or Chacos that you can use to walk out. And hopefully, you know, if you sprain an ankle or something, you can still walk out in a pair of sandals or, or shoes or what. If you sprain an ankle, you might be screwed and have to call in a... Yeah, you hear that Lula. chopper? You hear yeah, that chopper? Really so, you know, your, your zebra striped Crocs, you know, that, uh, that might not be the, the right uh, choice for camp shoes and, and water crossings. And an old pair of flow hose. 
Yeah, Crocs. Are, I love Crocs. I've, I've, I've embarrassed myself for years in, in Crocs just here in the big city. You know, I used to wear them all the time, but I would never consider taking them. There are a billion people that do. I've met them that take Crocs and they do just fine because all they do is they spend time in camp and they go, oh, these are great. You know, they're, they're totally cushy and they're wonderful. But again, if you have to hike any more than, you know, a few miles in a pair of Crocs, you're probably going to be in a great deal of pain, not, not pain, but, but, you know, they're, they're off the ground a bit. There's, you know, there's a higher center of gravity or whatever you call it. Uh, they're just not, I, I've met one person that was hiking in Crocs and she was not happy. So would you put a lot of miles in on wearing your Tevas? Or is yeah, a lot of miles. I, I, you know, and, and again, you know, being that I've done it so many times, I know where all the places are that I can do it. But yeah. uh, one of the things that when people start talking about footwear and whatnot, you know, and I start getting into it, uh, I'm, I always make an example of the fact that, you know, it's the middle of the day. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. You've got five more miles to go you know, or three more miles, or just over this pass, or whatever, and you're wasted, and your feet hurt, and what are you going to do? You slip on, you know, for me, it's like, and I always, and, and for me, the, my favorite thing is like that very first day out of, well, not the very first day, but that, that day out of Tuolumne, where you've walked up the entire valley, and suddenly you have to cross a river, you know, you have to cross the outlet there at uh, Upper Lyle Base Camp. It's like, keep your, keep your, keep your, Keep your, uh, keep your sandals on because you got to go another 15, 20 minutes to get up to the top there. And it's just always, for me, it's always very revitalizing. You know, I, I put the Crocs on or I put the Crocs, <laughs> I put the Teva on and, uh, you know, and I cross whatever little stream it is. And it's like, I suddenly feel great. You know, I, I'll spend a few minutes just standing in the stream and kind of like in, invigorating my legs. And it just, uh, I always say it, it gives my muscles something else to do. You know, it's like they've been in these shoes, whatever shoe, it could be a trail, run. it could be a totally comfortable trail runner. But, you know, if you just switch out your footwear, it gives your muscles something else to do. And you might be really tired and you might be wearing a pair of, you know, constrictive boots. And suddenly you're in these, you know, you're in these, you're standing in a stream and it's ice cold and you're in your, you're in your Tevas or your whatever's, your craw, your, and, and, and you start and suddenly you're alive and you can make that last three miles to the summit or to the camp or whatever. I mean, that's always been my experience. It's right. reinvigorating. <clears throat> nice. You know, kind of All right, Chopper, you. Chopper, you ready? We're going to play the game for the 50 bonus oh, points here. We're going to guess, we're going to guess Dr. Bob's magical place on the trail where you just need to, to just take a load off and enjoy the magic of this particular location. So we're, we're going to alternate guesses. We each get three guesses to try and get the 50 points. And if at the point of uh, uh, each of our three guesses were unsuccessful, then Dr. Bob you know, can tell us you know, what the place is or he may just keep it to himself. So, Chopper, you want to go first? Sure. I'm, okay. uh, I'm going to go with uh, Vermilion. You were very fond of uh, Vermilion and stopping in there. So I'm is, curious is if that's that, one of your top spots. Is that the magical location? That is a very magical location, very, very, very magical location. But that is, that is not the. Not the one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's a good one. That's All right. A, here's. here's I highly here's, recommend. You know, can we t can we talk about that for a sec? Uh, no. Sure, okay. just for a sec. Yeah. No. Never. Hey. Okay. But uh, yeah, I would suggest. I would highly suggest going to Vermilion. We'll put okay. It very good. Vermilion Valley Resort actually follows the John Frickamere podcast on yeah, Instagram. There you so go. They're, they're big fans. Well, hopefully yeah, they survived fan. the Creek fire. That got hit really bad this year. Yeah. 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 I'm real curious. I'm yeah, just, I'm right. just like, you know. Happy All right, Dr. Bob, here, here is my guess. My guess, I know that you have a, a predilection for uh, camping above the tree line, being in those high locations. So I'm going to guess that your magical spot is just below the the uh, trail sign for the Mount Whitney Trail, the last two miles up to Whitney. There is a, a a camping spot up there for about six camps, uh, six tents. Is is that the magical location? No, that's not. You know, oh. but, uh, I know that's uh, your favorite, Doc. That's yes. a that's a good spot. But at the same time, if you're if you're solo or if you're really comfy with whoever you are, there's a spot even lower than that, maybe five switchbacks below that. It's just like right off the trail. 
And if you're hiking up at like three in the morning, you're not, you might not see it because your, your headlamp's going to be like right on the, you know, on the trail. But there's a really neat spot that you could set up or bivy right on the trail, uh, right on the trail for like one, ultimately one tent or two people or something. That, yeah, I saw that, that spot. That I be, saw that uh, spot. Jukebox that spot, and I, yeah. Yeah. Jukebox yeah, no, and I were no. making our ascent up to you know, those six campsites up there. And we ran into one guy who was in that spot and he really? had sent his buddy up to see if the campsite up above was available. And if not, they were going to make do with the spot that he was kind of holding, holding that spot uh, for the two of them. If, if it didn't work out up top. So uh, I, I, I know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I've never All right. Seen Chopper. There. All right Chopper, your my, next guest. My next guest is going to be my favorite is a uh, Wanda Lake. I thought that was one of the, the prettiest places to uh, camp. No, Wanda is again not my absolute favorite, but it is def it's one it's it's on my top five. It's it I was great think. because the sunrise was spectacular there. The way it just it rolls over the mountain and the whole, the lake just starts to come to life with color. It's it's beautiful up there at sunrise. Yeah, I've always stayed there. Yeah. All right. That was I gonna be you, my yours, that, Doc. Sorry. that was gonna be my next one because Wanda was was phenomenal. It's it's a fantastic site and location. But since you've taken Wanda, I'm going to go with another, another place that comes after a very difficult climb. And I find that the, the more difficult the climb, the sweeter the location, at least in your mind, that's how it plays out. And I'm going to say the Palisades Lakes. <clears throat> yeah, the oh. Palisades Lakes, again, are wonderful. But uh, I've never actually stayed at Palisades Lakes. Yeah, I've like I've gotten through there and gone. Oh, this is beautiful, but I gotta keep going. All right, I think my, my my last guess. Hey, oh, yeah. Palisades Lakes. I'm I'm not confident in this one because it's pretty popular, but the Ray Lakes area is a uh, pretty pretty darn spectacular. Yeah, let everybody stay there. That's yeah, that's the problem. It's it's probably too popular for what you're just de- what you're describing. Yeah, you know, it's I, I, again I I gave up talking about my my favorite place. And I, I may even move my favorite place um, sort of like east a bit, you know, which is something I need. It's, it's one of those places I still haven't, you know, if I've, I've gone up there a billion times and I've said, I should go over there and try check out that area. You can but, side trips? Yeah, do a side trip. It wouldn't take long, you know, it would take you half an hour to walk back in there and go, oh yeah, this is great. There's nobody here. You know, and uh, but even even my favorite place is is you know I stand on the I stand there and go hey I'm over here you know come and see me and uh, oh I have to say my my one story about my favorite place is one time I was there and uh, I was I I was on the trail and I was I was as everybody is here's a hint I was in a hurry like everybody is okay everybody think. Where are you in a hurry? I was in a hurry, but I stopped and I looked. I spent a few moments there and I pulled, I had, it was, this is actually my first or second time and I had a pair of binoculars, really, really small binoculars. But I pulled them out because I saw something weird on the other side of this, de- away, <laughs> other side of this little lake, we'll put it that way. And uh, I pulled out the binoculars and it turned out to be this beautiful blonde woman who happened to be totally naked. And she's wandering around this tent and she's, you know, striking all these poses and there's a photographer there and he's taking pictures of her. And then she gets in the tent and he's taking more pictures and suddenly they realize, oh, there's a guy that's, you know, 500 yards away and he's got binoculars. And so they, they, uh, they closed their operation and, and, <laughs> and, and I kept going. You know. I was going to say, that was a very specific uh, place to uh, camp that there's a naked woman at the camp. Yeah. Yeah, no wonder it's his favorite place. Yeah, yeah. Camp there. That's it. There you go. There's my, there's my specific place to stay. If there's a naked woman, stay there. All right, Doc, you got one more guess. One more guess. I'm not confident in this because I don't think it matches up with what he was saying, but I'm going to go that uh, maybe the favorite place, the magical place, is camping in the shadows of – Mount Darwin and Mount Mendel on the uh, the edge of Evolution Lake. Nope. Again, ah. he's going to pick something like the top of Forrester, which has just been hell. Yeah. For, uh, I've, all the time been up there. I've only stayed on the top. I haven't stayed on the top of Forrester. I've stayed on Glen. Uh, yeah, I've stayed on Glen Pass. And what else have I stayed on? 
I think I've stood on Glen Pass once. Most of the passes aren't set up to stay at. No, they aren't really. But Glen Pass, if you're up there and you look around, it's got it, all the passes. Well, I should say they all have they all have spots you could stay on. Yeah, Glen's so skinny. It's yeah. Like, well, well, yeah, uh, yeah. But Glen has got a great little spot right on it. Uh, like if you look what? on my Facebook page, I think there's a picture of me there. Okay. It's got like a. You know, I would call it a tombstone, but we'll call it a headrest or something. But uh, yeah, there's one spot where, you know, a single person could stay there quite comfortably. I did. All right, so we didn't get the 50 points, but are you, are you going to share or are you going to keep it to yourself? Uh, I think I'll keep it to myself. All right, that's fair. That's fair. You know, uh, this is perfect. This is perfect gonna... because if our listeners out there, if they've got guesses, hey, you know what? Leave a review. And in your review, make a guess on Dr. Bob's magical place, and we will check with him to see if you're correct. So uh, they, get, they can get the 50 points after that's that. That's right. That's right. They yeah. can get the 50 points. We are going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of Dr. Bob's 14, 14 JMT through hikes. So stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. Hey, Hiker Trash, this is Ginger Balls. You're listening to the John Frickin' Mirror Podcast. And welcome back. Got uh, myself here, Doc, and Chopper, and we are talking to Dr. Bob about his various experiences in the Sierras and beyond. And one of the things that really stood out in our, our uh, messages back and forth, Dr. Bob, is the fact that you have been on the JMT, you've done 14 through hikes of the JMT. That's, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, we were talking about gear earlier. Over those 14 trips, what do you think has been the, the kind of the best evolution of gear, whether it was the, you know, Tiva sandals or is it a better backpack or what do you think has improved the most over those 14 uh, trips? Uh, I mean, in, in general, everything's gotten lighter. Tiva sandals, you know, footwear has, I mean, uh, foot, everything's gotten lighter. Uh, but I think packs and, and certainly with uh, quilts, you know, every, everything has gotten lighter. Um, when, I, when, I, when I started, when I did my first JMT, again, I was carrying a, a seven and a half pound pack. But that was mostly crazy preference. I don't know. Uh, you know, I had a five and a half pound sleeping bag. Um, and you know, I had a heavy pack, I had a heavy sleeping bag and everything else was heavy and I didn't have a bear canister. So I had like a billion pounds of food there. So I really didn't have to think about it. I was just like, I'll stick all this food in this pack, all this in this bag. And then I'll did put you, it in this bag. Did you have to suspend it every night? Is that how you dealt with the bears? Uh, yeah, the couple, the first, first, first couple times, uh, if there's no reason to argue about it or even talk about it really, uh, but the bear canister is the magic ingredient to doing the JMT right. in a very sort of casual way. I, I had, uh, you know, my first couple of times were all, you know, hanging and every night was a disaster. You know, every night was, uh, you know, trial and error trying to get a bag up a tree and then, you know, only to see it get taken. And, uh, well, that, that would be rough if you were up at a high elevation, too, where there's no trees. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of my fondest memories of that was I was up uh, below, uh, where was I? Below Mather, and I had found a place to camp, and it, unfortunately, it happened to be, like, really close to these two lovebirds, and they were totally pissed off that I was there, and I was stupid enough to, like, what's your problem, you know? Uh, we all got a camp up here, you know? Uh, but uh, they had bear canisters, and all I really remember from this scene was me trying, you know, running around swearing and trying to like hang a bear canister. And they're kind of, they've got, or not a bear canister, but my bags. And they had, uh, they had the two bear canisters, and the two bear canisters were kind of propped up against one another. And uh, all I could see were these, this, this lovey dovey couple and their bear canisters. And just mocking you. Yeah. And I got, I was like, I got to get a bear canister. That's all there is to it. It's really, you know, there, you don't have to think about it now because it's it's an absolute law, you know. But but they really are. They take away so much of the stress, you know. Doctor Bob, you mentioned a quilt, and so I'm curious as to what your preferred sleep system is. Uh, 
Yeah, right now I use a quilt. Uh, I use a quilt from a company that no longer exists because apparently it was independently owned and the guy decided to retire and close the company down. It was a Brooks Range quilt, but really great. And, uh, you know, buy a quilt. It's, it's perfect. Yeah, you know, and everybody is. It's, it's almost a, what is it, a, a non-subject at this point. Everybody's buying quilts. Uh, yeah, I've got a quilt that's rated, supposedly rated to 32 degrees. I, I went out last summer, uh, end of the summer, September with my son, and we camped at Thousand Island Lake. And I had six layers of clothing on and uh, a quilt, and I was under a tarp, and I, I made it through, but it was, it was, it was a bit uh, chilly. No, well, I, you know, I've got uh, like a 15 degree rated quilt. And nice. I, honestly, when I first got it, I was like, this is going to work. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> I just, you know, I got it in the, you know, I had it in the, when I picked it up at the front door, I was like, there's nothing in this box. <laughs> there's nothing here. You know, and then I, I pulled it out and I'm like, wait a minute, you know, but, uh, and, you know, and, and I blindly took it out on the JMT and said, whatever you know and it was warm and toasty every night i was totally happy um you know and it weighs uh less than two pounds compared to the five and a half pounds that i used to carry so yeah quilts are a great way to go these days um i don't pay much attention to the to uh, uh pads you know i don't I don't uh, research our values or anything like that. Maybe that's the next thing I'll do. But yeah, I, you know, and I've been kind of uh, disappointed in the few pads that I've had. They haven't worked. I mean, they've, you know, they've, what do you call it? They've, uh, they've deflated on me. So you end up spending, you know, a couple times a night, you're, re, 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 you're, you're, uh, you're blowing up your pad again. But that's a great uh, overall, quilt wise, I'm really happy. Yeah, get a quilt. Nice. Nice. Yeah, now, yeah. Before we before we get to your fourteen JMTs, uh, quick question: Any desire, or have you already? Have you done the the longer trail of the PCT? No, have not done the PCT. Uh, I, one of the reasons that again that I've done the JMT so many times is because I live in California, in San Francisco, uh, and I have no money, <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I'm you know, I know exactly what to do every summer. You know, it's, 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 it's pretty routine. It's, it's really easy to do JMT for me, but you know, the, uh, doing something like the PCT or the AT or anything, it requires a lot more planning mm -hmm. uh, and a lot more time. And if anything, a lot more money, you know, if I win the lottery or something or, you know, and I suddenly come into a bunch of money and have nothing else to do, I'll do the PCT. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's definitely not cheap. I, the folks that I've talked to uh, on the show have talked about you know, having to save, you know, thousands of dollars to be able to make this trip happen. So yeah, right. the logistics have got to be pretty tough too. Planning everything out and getting all the food delivered and the resupplies and all that. It's a it's a process. Yeah, you've got to be on all of that, or or have maybe even a team. Like I think there are a lot of people that have like you know their parents or their girlfriend is is, you know, is there for them to send out the packages every couple of weeks or whatever. And me, I'd be like, honey, could you? No. You'd be hungry after a week too. Yeah, I'd be hungry after a week. Yeah. But I, you know, I'd really like to do it. Um, ultimately, I'm looking at doing other trails that are perhaps as long. I'd love to do the Colorado Trail right now. That's kind of, that's kind of my other goal right now is to get out and do the Colorado Trail. All right. Very good. So of the 14 times you've done the John Muir Trail, does any one of those stand out in any way? Was one of, was one of those your, your favorite? And if so, what made it your favorite? Why did it stand out? I would probably have to say that my first, the first time I did it was my favorite only because it was so messed up. <laughs> <laughs> it was so messed up that I was like, I got to do it again, you know? And, and, and even, you know, all 14 of these have been, uh, to me, they've always been, you know, they've always been messed up in a certain way. There's always been some person. There's always something. There's always something that screwed it up. I mean, you can do it one time and, and you can have a lot, you can make a lot of mistakes and you can get through it and you can go, 
oh, that was great. You know, oh yeah, I did the JMT, you know, I mean, you know, whatever, you broke a leg or, you know, somebody tried to murder you, I don't know what. But for me, it was, uh, man, that first one was screwed up. I'm gonna, but I was hooked. I mean, I was just absolutely hooked by the JMT. And, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, but, but, you know, again, the first one, if it had been perfect in every way or, or, you know, whatever, but it was less than perfect. It was less than 50. It was, it was verging on 50% perfect. You know, 50% is that uh, what I made it. Uh, but the rest of it, that other 50, if I'm describing it correctly, was like a hellhole. And it was just like, okay, I've got to do this again where I can enjoy it. And it just took me a long time. And it's still taking me a long time to figure out, uh, you know, the, 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 the silly cliche thing again about hike your own hike, you know, I just don't, I've never, only maybe the last two or three times I hiked my own hike, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't hook up with anybody I didn't want to, I went at my very own pace, I stopped where I wanted to, you know, uh, on all the other times I've, I've been involved with uh, other people, uh, which is not to say if my buddy Gio is listening to these podcasts that <laughs> he was the best. our hikes were ever, ever anything more than mwah, the best. But uh, I've done it a couple of times where it was just, uh, it just got stupid. And, you know, I was sorry that I wasn't sorry that I did it, but I just, you know, my encounters were not good. So you definitely, if you, if you want to do the jam, if you're hiking solo, stay solo unless you just really can feel it out this other person or whatever or people or what a group you know just you're you're better off just like not being afraid of being solo there's so many people that go out there like i can't hike it i gotta find partners you know i'm like go by yourself do it that's where the real value in the jmt or anything long is is finding yourself you know, and not finding yourself in a group of people or anything, you know, like that. Um, and, and avoid I mean, I, I, avoid mystical Manny at all costs. Avoid yeah. mystical Manny. Actually, mystical Manny was the good part of that story, uh, <laughs> sort of. You know, it was the other guy, Kurt with a K, that was not the good story. Uh, yeah, avoid uh, avoid people on massive amounts of pot or that have just like one opinion you know or, or one train of thought avoid right. mathematicians yeah that you know, really philosophy, you're probably okay you go with the yeah. mathematician you're screwed the messed the messed up uh aspect of uh what made that memorable really rings true because chopper you and i have had some some messed up moments on the trail and those are some of my favorite stories to to kind of relive now that i'm in the safety of my own home but um you know the mineral a, a mineral king from other people yeah mineral king loop mineral king loop was one of my favorite hikes just because of the uh the turn yeah, that it right. took with with poor chopper here earning his his trail name on that particular hike I, I, I'm, I'm happy that uh you know my my pain and suffering has made me so so happy <laughs> one of my favorite pictures of all time is you laying down being attended to by the ranger and uh you know i've got this kind of grin on my look face. On face. yeah <laughs> mrs chopper loves that photo <laughs> yeah so i know you mentioned mineral king earlier dr bob and it just brought back all kinds of memories because chopper uh, ran into a nasty bout of altitude sickness and had to be helicoptered out of there oh yeah well there you go yeah, i can do about it I felt, I mean, the day before I felt great and Doc was dying. Oh yeah. You, you were, you were kicking my butt. You yeah. left me in the dust. Don't know what happened. We'll never figure it out. It was, I just felt like I was just, it was horrible. It yeah. Was the worst pain in my, I've ever had. Yeah. Another favorite memory is going over Forrester Pass with you and Buddy in 2015 and being a half mile from the, from the <laughs> summit there and the weather turning and uh, lightning and thunder and hail and us looking at each other going like, what the hell are we doing here? Why are we here? How do we get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of the fun of doing these trips is that you, you experience so much ups and downs. And, you know, it's, it's the experience part is being out there. That's To me, that's the greatest part. And, you know, the other fun part is having the good stories when you're done. Yep. And, you know, we sit around telling the same stories and our wives look at us like, yes, we remember. We've heard this story before. <laughs> uh 
but the story is good enough to tell, you know, five, six, 10, 12 times. So exactly. don't, don't get in our way. Exactly. She's got it. Yeah, All right. Dr. Bob is looking for his battery pack. He is no I longer in screen. Pack. I thought I was going to be good. But We're improvising here. Second, yeah, That's right. We can't, don't, don't let your computer die there, Dr. Bob. We've, oh. we've got, uh, we've got a, a little bit more to talk about. More to talk about. I weigh myself. Okay. It's hard to navigate my, my, my living room with all the furniture moved around. Okay. I don't think we've uh, asked you this, uh, Bob. As, on your trips, how many days did you average over the 14 trips? Was it you know, like 10 days, 20 days? How, how, do you uh, take off or do you take your time? Mostly about, uh, uh, I would say about uh, an average of maybe 16 days. Okay. So it's a I good pace if you're not doing it. Yeah, I think the first time I did it, I was, you know, I was gung-ho like everybody doing their first trip. And I was with, a, you know, again, I was with Mystic Manny and Kurt with a K. And uh, they were both into doing it really fast. Or not really fast, but we, we did it in 14 days. And, but ever since then, I've done it in more like 17 to 19 days. And the one time I went with, uh, well, not the one time, but the one, one time I went with my buddy Gio, we did a lot of videotaping and, and made a great little film. And uh, uh, Diablo. And uh, I think we spent like 24 days. It was nice. Okay. More side yeah. trips and just kind of casual. Yeah, well, no, actually, it wasn't more side trips. It was okay. really more standing around editing and doing take after take. Oh, okay. Very nice. Uh, where, where can we find a copy of the film, uh, the short film Diablo? This is probably, uh, if you look up, D if you just Google uh, JMT Diablo, JMT Diablo, you, uh, you'll probably Good find it. Is it on YouTube or did you post it somewhere? It's on YouTube, yeah. All yeah. right. Diablo, I think it might be called Diablo Does the JMT. Yeah. All right, well, check that out. Hey, would yeah. it surprise you to know that I had a couple of fast packers on the, the, J, the, uh, the JFM pod, uh, yeah. Gabe and Kevin, and Gabe, his wife only gave him a week, said, you, you know, you can have a week to do this hike, and so they did it in six days. Yeah, that sounds like a joke. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah. yeah, I'm all for those people. You know, that, that's cool, but I'm, I'm, you know. Kevin um, actually said, Kevin actually gave me the title for the episode, and it was uh, How Not to Hike the JMT. Yeah, there you go. How Not to Hike the JMT. Yeah, yeah. I won't go into that. But. All right. I, I, I found Diablo Hikes the JMT. Is it uh, by a guy named Dave? Yeah. All right. We found it. Hold on, though. Yeah. Hey. Send me the link, Chopper. I got to watch that tonight. I'll send it over to you. The, the picture that pops up on uh, YouTube is looks like someone wearing a uh, devil mask. So okay. it's, it's a devil puppet. It's okay. a de that's oh, Diablo, yeah. the devil puppet. Yeah. Oh, I got it. All right. Well, let's, we'll check it out later. That's funny. Yeah, that was, again, that, was, that, was, that was good times. We'll include that link to that video in the, uh, the social media of the John Freaking Muir Pod to make sure that all, all our listeners are able to, to find that. Yeah, it's one more JMT video people can watch. Uh, yeah. It was really funny because it, it, he was actually the first person that I met. Uh, the first time I did the JMT, we met in the Amtrak station here in San Francisco. And uh, he was only going out to do a loop in Yosemite, but we both had the same book. It was called, uh, it was by John Cabot Zinn, I think. Uh, it's called Wherever You Go, There You Are, you know? So it was kind of funny that, you know, we both had this same book and, and we both remained wonderful friends for all these years. But uh, yeah, anyway. Well, Diablo, Diablo is a little under eight minutes long, so it shouldn't be too hard for anybody. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not, it's not too long. Yeah. All right. Cool. But because, it, because of that eight minute film, it took you 24 days instead of 14? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. It was crazy. Well, yeah. I mean, it, might have been, it might have been less than that. I can't remember, but I think it was about 24 days. Yeah. And we did a lot of like stopping and, you know, we'd set up, it was like shooting a movie, you know, you'd stop, you'd set up, you'd, sh you'd shoot a scene and then you'd go like, that wasn't any good. Let's do that again. You know, or we'd craft service and 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 hang out. Yeah. We'd just hang out. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a lot of downtime, you know, that where you weren't moving, you were just trying to set up a shot, that kind of thing. All right. Here we are. We're at uh, Dr. Bob's JMT top five. 
I'm not going to give you a, a, a predefined set in terms of, is this the top five campsites? Is this the top five sites? Is this the top five places to avoid? Uh, I'm going to leave it up to you to share your JMT top five. Start with, uh, number, start with number five. Uh, number five would probably be, yeah, because I want to mix it up a bit. I would say uh, number five would probably be uh, Donahue Pass. And not Donahue Pass per se, but, but staying up below Donahue Pass. If you're going north to south, uh, I always stay up, 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 up high there. And, you know. Is that the magical place? That is a no no. That is a that is that is a, a magic place. That is a magic place in that it's like you know you're into day three or something of your JMT. If you started in the valley, you're probably into day two or three, and it's like you're 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 almost out the door of Yosemite. You know, you're you're leaving Yosemite essentially, okay. but you, and you're really on the on on the way. You know, you've suffered through getting from the valley up to Tuolumne. You've gone all, and then you've had this totally, totally casual day going up Lyle Canyon, and uh, you know, and now you're 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 below Donahue Pass on the north side, and it's you're looking down on 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 Lyle Canyon, and it's just it's beautiful, you know. It's probably that lake where we saw the guy with the kilt. That's that sounds like the same area. Yes. Yep. The guy with the kilt was that John Lath? Uh, don't recall what his name was. <laughs> Could have been, could have been, if he was wearing a kilt and a pair of pants, that was John Ladd. Okay, very good. No, it was yeah, if it wasn't a guy with a kilt, if it wasn't a guy wearing pants, you probably didn't see John Ladd, because I've only ever seen John Ladd in a kilt wearing pants, so. But that's <laughs> it's kind of like uh, belt, yeah, that's so, kind of like belt and suspenders. Belts and suspenders, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, John, did you hear that? Um, belts and suspenders. Uh, so that was number five or one, whatever you wanted to. So I would say Donahue Pass. Uh, I would say, definitely say uh, Vermilion. Uh, Vermilion is a wonderful place. You know, oh, go, yeah. to, go to VBR, hang out there. Uh, uh, you know, I worked there uh, two summers, you might say, or one summer, essentially. Actually, I worked there one time when I was on the trail and I just called them from Reds and said, hey, you need somebody? And they're like, get here. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked there for two weeks, and then I continued on. Nice. So shout out to yeah. VVR, one of our Instagram followers. Yeah. So, yeah, VVR is a great place. Uh, you know, we can talk about the difference between VVR and MTR. MTR is nice, too, if you've got bucks and, you know, a few more restrictions and whatnot. But, yeah, VVR is really the place to go. Nice. Um, if All right, you, number, you, number three. If you're going to spend a down day, you know, you know, or if you get out there and you know nothing, you know, you're going to be really shocked if you go to MTR and go, oh, I'm going to spend a day here. You're going to be like, things are, this is not good. This is not what I expected. VVR, you're going to get everything you want, kind of. Um, uh, so, and I don't know, I, I, I would say three, four, and five would be any three, of the, three, three, two, and one. Three, two, and one would be any of the, the big, getting over the big passes. I mean, my number one spot still is, uh, all right, I'll, I'll give it up. My number one spot on the JMT would be, <laughs> would be and, and I give it up only because I know that most people aren't going to do it or stop there, and it would be Bighorn Plateau. Oh, um, yes. I should have said that. Yeah, yeah. That Big is Horn one of my Plateau. favorite spots, too. Bighorn yeah, Plateau well, is awesome. Bighorn Plateau is awesome. And most people will most people will go over Forrester in the morning. They will bust it to get down off of Forrester. They will and they will camp uh, at whatever it is, Wallace Creek. Or, 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 or maybe Tyndall. Tyndall, uh, yeah. They, Tyndall, camp, yeah. They, they might camp at Tyndall. If they got a really late start, they'll camp at Tyndall. Or they'll, you know, they'll keep going and they'll go right over Bighorn Plateau and they'll stay yes. at Wallace, I guess Wallace Creek. Or they'll go all, I mean, I've known people that are like, we're going to Crabtree tonight, you know? So it's like, yeah, have fun. Go to Crabtree tonight. You know, yeah. or get as, get as close as you can to Whitney. 
2017, uh, 2017 jukebox and I, our, our goal was to camp at Bighorn Plateau and we fell short and camped again in Tyndall where, where Buddy and Chopper and I had camped uh, a couple of years previous. But uh, you're right, Bighorn Plateau, that, that's a worthy number one. I, I, I really like that pick. Yeah, I don't want anybody to, you know, remember Bighorn Plateau. And all I, my only advice is stay off the grass. You know, when you get there, there's a little, you know, there's a little no-name lake out there. And, uh, you know, walk out there as gingerly as you can and camp in the sand and don't camp on the grass or the rangers will magically appear, the Paluskis, you know. Uh, what's there, Mrs. Paluski is at the Tyndall Lake Ranger Station and Mr. Paluski is at the Crabtree Station. And, you know, they, I think they have a, they must have a camera or a, you know, some kind of a, some, some, something that says, ESP. On the grass. We have to go out there and tell them to get off the grass. So yeah, don't camp on the grass. But the bighorn to me has always been this sort of, you know, and again, it took me seven, eight times on the JMT to finally go, wait, I'm just going to stop right here. Because it, it's a great place to, to sit and reflect. You've got this massive view, 360 billion degrees. And uh, it's just, it's, it's kind of magical. You know, I mean, I'm not a spiritual person, but if you're sitting out there next to the lake on the, on the dirt, on the sand, you know, and you're just looking at everything and just taking everything you've done in, especially if you've gone north to south, uh, it's, it's pretty nice. You know, it's, 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 it's a great place to think about it all. And then you wake up in the morning and you go, all right, time to kick it into gear and get yeah. to Crabtree or go over Whitney or whatever it is you're going to do in that one day. But for me, uh, the Bighorn is, is, is the place to, to take it all in, you know, to, to absorb yep. it all, what, what you've actually done, you know, and what, what for most people you may never do again, you know, you're going to go home and you're going to, you know, you're retired and you're going to go on to your next trip to uh, Niagara Falls or whatever. But yeah. It's a yeah. striking, it's a striking location. It Absolutely. is a striking location. Yeah, but a lot of people, you know, they, 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 they say, they get there and they say, there were no trees there. It was exposed. It was this, it was that. And, and, it's, and, I, and I always say, thank you for saying that. <laughs> That's what makes it so unique. What's that? Yeah, yeah it's, it's really unique. Yeah. And my... Right. Uh, and, and I can't think of the names of them, but between Bighorn, if you were just looking up, if you were sitting on Bighorn and you were looking up, say, at Whitney, you know, those, those lakes off to the, if, if, if you just looked east, uh, you know, there's some lakes back there that would really be cool. And one of these days I will go back there and stay at those lakes. I can't remember what they're called right now. But uh, that would be another really cool place to stay, simply because there'd be nobody there. And again, you know, as a sort of last, you know, uh, being at Bighorn is kind of like being on the, uh, it's, 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 it's kind of like being on the on-ramp to the freeway, you might say, you know, because once you hit, once you hit Crabtree uh, and guitar, you're like, you're on the freeway. Right. You know, yeah. That kind of thing, you know. Yep. Bighorn is like, well, we have a choice here. Let me see. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that is my spot. All right. Okay. You gave it up. Thank you. Check in with the wife. Right. Dr. Bob, hey, do you know where we are right now? I don't know where we are. We are at the point where I turn to you and say, hey, Dr. Bob, what's your pro tip insight of the week for our listeners? My pro tip insight for our listeners is, once again, as we discussed earlier, I would say – Hike your own hike. I hate to say that because I hear it all the time and it always sounds silly, but that's really what you got to do on the JMTs. Hike your own hike. If you go out there or find your own, I, maybe we could modify it and say find your own hike. You're going to go, a lot of people are like afraid is everything to, to like hike solo. Women, men, it doesn't matter. People are just afraid to be by themselves. And I was afraid to be by myself on that very first trip, which is why I ended up with Mystic Manny and Kurt with a K and all of the problems that they, uh, uh, what's the word, brought to me, incurred, et cetera, et cetera. Incurred? I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, but yeah, yeah. 
hike your own hike, you know, get out there, get a feel for things. Uh, if you decide to go out there and hike solo, do your very best to stay solo, you know, uh, meet people, you know, unless they're absolutely wonderful and you know things are going to be great and they're not asking, if they're not asking anything of you, spend time with people. It's, it's the people that are saying, well, look, I decided I'm going to walk this much faster because I need to get out a day sooner. You know, I've had this happen once or twice where it's like, oh, you're going along and you meet somebody and they're like, yeah, well, I want to, what, what day do you want to get out? You want to get out on the, on the 2nd of uh, September? I want to get out on the, on, the, on the 29th of August. So you say, oh, well, we're having a good time. I'll hike with you and I'll hike faster and I'll, do what, I'll, I'll basically do your itinerary. And that doesn't always work. So really just, you know, if you go out there and you've given your employer, you know, you said, I'm going to be gone from this time to this time, take that time, you know, don't, don't get involved in somebody else's hike. That's great. Yeah. Great pro tip. Thank you. Chopper, you want to weigh in with a pro tip as well? No, I, uh, I really like that one. It, uh, yeah. it kind of resonates of don't, don't try to be somebody else while you're out there. Because yep. that, that's part of going out there is, you know, kind of discovering a little bit about yourself. So that's a, that's a good tip. Yep. All right. So there you have it. That's it. Our special holiday episode with Dr. Bob and Chopper is in the books. I hope our listeners enjoyed our time with these two legends of the trail. And I want to thank them for joining us this week. Guys, how can our listeners keep up with you on social media? And where can they find updates on your latest adventures? We'll start with uh, Dr. Bob. I really don't. Uh, I run a group uh, called San Francisco Backcountry Skiers on Facebook. I pretty much moderate it and uh, let everybody else do the talking. Uh, otherwise, I have a page called uh, What Would John Muir, a blog spot called John, What Would John Muir Do? And I don't write anything there anymore. Once in a while, <laughs> I put something down. But, you know, uh, when the season is in, I'm pretty much on the JMT pages all the time. Okay. And so I guess the way that they'll keep up with your adventures is when you uh, are a guest correspondent on the JM, J, uh, the JFM pod. Yeah. Any, any, any place. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Chopper, oh, how about you? Uh, I randomly uh, show up on a podcast of a friend of mine. That's about as much uh, social media footprint I have. Do I know him? Um, I think you're familiar. Okay. <laughs> All right. Remember to, Check out the pod on social media as well. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you have comments or clips you want to share, you can send it to me at johnfreakinmuir at gmail.com. Also, if you are enjoying the podcast, take just a minute and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're not enjoying the pod, well, just go ahead and keep that to yourself. Right, Dr. Bob? Absolutely. <laughs> That's a wrap from the John Freakin Muir studio. Any final thoughts, guys? I just hope everybody has a, a great holiday season. You know where two beers gets you? Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for tuning in. Always remember the trail is the trail. It doesn't care if you want to go downhill. It doesn't care if it's almost dark and you're looking for a campsite. It doesn't even care if you're a bear specialist sharing stories with Japanese tourists. The trail is the trail. Embrace the suck. <laughs>